Good evening, officially. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. You're all very welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library here in the heart of the Boyne Valley at the gateway to the Boyne Valley in Drogheda, partly in the county of Louth, mostly in the county of Louth, partly in the county of Meath. I have said, uh, greeted uh, several people uh, by message and I didn't get through them all um, when the countdown uh, concluded. So uh, my apologies uh, for that, but we will get round to you all. A very good evening to you all. We are continuing to read from William Wakeman's 1848 Handbook of Irish Antiquities. A fascinating insight into the condition uh, of the monuments in the mid 19th century and also into the sort of insights that were floating around at the time. Bear in mind, folks, as always, that most of what was written about the uh, prehistoric, some of uh, Wakeman's work is about Christian monuments as well, Bear in mind that most of the work from that century, the 19th century, written about Irish monuments, written by English or uh, British antiquarians. Um, a lot of it not written by, I mean, at the time this was written, uh, a lot of Irish people couldn't read or write and spoke Oskelga uh, all of the time. They spoke Irish. I am doing my very best to do what I can for the revival of the Irish language. I'm not a very good Irish speaker, but I'm doing my best uh, to welcome people, ask Elga, when I can. I may butcher a few words and some pronunciations. Um, so since St. Bridget's Day, it has been, and in bulk, a few days later, on the 4th, it has been really noticeable here in Ireland that spring is in the air. today. The temperature reached a balmy 14 degrees, which is, he quickly types into Google, 57.2 F, or Fahrenheit. A balmy day, a little bit breezy and quite cloudy, but wow. And the sun is definitely higher in the sky and stronger. The day is longer. The dawn chorus in the mornings is, is getting earlier and more raucous. It's got this beautiful raucousness. You know, myself and my wife watched yesterday evening or the evening before we watched a blackbird uh, towards evening time uh, on uh, a nearby television aerial or antenna. And, uh, oh, boy, he was singing his little heart out, you know. I said to the missus, I said, he's looking for a mate, you know. It's coming into that time of year. But it is just such a wonderful thing. Uh that feeling that we're shaking off the stasis of winter. And uh, I've written in my own private journaling about the condition of semi-hibernation or stasis that I've been in, that I perhaps haven't been doing as much or been as active over the winter time. And just suddenly there's a an energy in the air. There's a, there's a warmth and there's an energy and there's a brightness that says, Get up off your backside, old fella, and do a bit. Anyway, hope that makes resonates with people or makes some sense. But if it does, it does. It's entirely personal. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter was the first one on show. Tommy on show, my sure. Uh, all present and correct from the Lone Star County. Great to see you, Elaine. Thank you for joining us. Patricia Pack is in the house. Patricia Falcher, Marsha Downs, Slauncher. Hope this Monday is treating all kindly. I had a mad day. I had a sort of a very busy day at work, but I managed it very well. I was kind of in top sort of mental form for it for some reason. I got through it sort of all just in, in order and just, yep, do that, do that, do that, do that, do that. And I even advertised the live stream this morning earlier than I normally would. I normally leave it till lunchtime or early afternoon. So I'm a bit giddy. Maureen O'Leary is in the house. Good evening, uh, Maureen. Uh, welcome. Tar is jock. And uh, find a, a, a car here. Find a chair. Good day, Mr. Anthony and Tua. This is Kathy May Dayo, one of our regular regulars. So happy to be here for the whole episode. I'm off work today for the President's Day holiday here in Newcastle, Washington State. Hope all are doing well. Brilliant stuff, Kathy. A very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Delighted to hear you can stay for the whole thing. Adrian O'Begaline. Connasato to Makara. Agasan, I'm sure. Uh, e, uh, Gondi Wicklow. 
uh, uh, Facebook user, this is Wayne Bird. Wayne, who is one of the Mythical Ireland patrons. I hope you don't mind me saying that, uh, Wayne. I'm sorry. I, I I probably should ask permission, but I remember seeing, I, I've watched a lot of the standings or the uh, prehistory guys live streams, and they just announced their patrons. It seems to be par for the course. But then patrons at the Bronze Age level and above get their names in the credits of the video. So I presume it's okay. Anyway, Wayne, it's great to see you. Uh, buds and growth in the garden and potatoes. You know what I mean? And the birds singing. Life is good. Teresa McGuinness says, greetings, friends. Teresa, you're very welcome. Make yourself at home. Make yourself comfortable. Helen Hurst Chatter is in the Black Hills of South Dakota, where it's still snowy. And I suspect it could be snowy for a while because they're mountains and they're higher up. But uh, Helen, I hope you are keeping warm and snug and that you're all ready for this evening's uh, delve into ancient Ireland. Monica Regley is in Switzerland. Hello, Monica. Good evening to you. I hope, again, surrounded by mountains, it's probably snowy where you are. Again, I hope you are uh, nicely um, snug and wrapped up. Tara Sky Dressler is in Pincher Creek, Alberta, Canada where I suspect it's probably also snowy. Tara, welcome. What a beautiful name. And a shout out to my own daughter, whose name is Tara. And with all my love. Desiree Riley is in the house in Louisiana, setting the camper and for the Mardi Gras parades. Brilliant stuff. And I hope, um, I'm always uh, fearful of pronouncing it wrong. Is it Azalea? how could i not even know that uh the doggy uh, and i still haven't set up the pooches and pets page i know i know i'm getting around to it i am look um, when a man says he'll do something he'll do it there's no need to remind him every six months <laughs> nick eska casterton is in the house hello nick and i hope all is well in the casterton household what a delight to see you here Leanne Delaney is in Dromore in the county of Down. Hello, Leanne. Good evening to you. Hope all is well. Joe Butler, Auntie Joe is in the house. Auntie Joe is a busy little bee. She's a great woman, a great, great uh, supporter. And uh, uh, hats off. And thank you for everything. Uh, hope everyone is ready for another excellent episode. Well, what if it's not an excellent episode and it's punctuated by awful dad jokes? Irish Technical Thinker says, greetings to a more, August Tufain, uh, Marcus, thank you for joining us, good to see you, greetings everyone from Grants Pass, Oregon, that is Anne Scott Doherty, hello Anne, and I hope you are very good and in great form, yet yeah, here the same, but all sunny too, says Monica, sunny and snow, hey, sounds like a good combination, just make sure you wear the, sungla the sunglasses or the snow glasses. We're supposed to get a windstorm, says Kathy May, in tonight in Newcastle, Washington State, and then Arctic air blast coming up from the Arctic, going to hit us on Wednesday night, and maybe have snow flurries and in the teens at night. Batten down the hatches. Robert Friend is in the house. What a wonderful name, Robert. Robirge Cara. Robert Friend. What a fantastic name. A very friendly, friendly individual. Uh, Robert, you are very welcome to this friendly arena where we like to make people feel they're part of something. Mavanway Melward is in the house. The daffodils are just starting to bloom here in Bristol. They'll all be out for St. David's Day. I'm familiar with Bristol from the point of view that I've flown in and out of there on my way to Glastonbury. <laughs> uh, quick hop across the Irish Sea. I think it's a half an hour flight, maybe even less, 25 minutes. But uh, hope all is good with you, Mavanway. Great to see you. Archaeostronomy Database, whose tie is in the house, taking a little research break to join in live after a few busy days. Folks, if you haven't done so, please go to Tyrell's wonderful, wonderful YouTube channel, which is the Archaeostronomy Database. Not the, just Archaeostronomy Database. He's been doing some wonderful studies of the alignments of various monuments, not just Irish ones, a new video about Thornborough Henges two of the three of which have been granted to the public in Britain. Uh, fascinating stuff. So absolutely give him a like and a follow. Shosef Achirja, Giagrich Mokhara, Konosata to Damien Mullen is in Ballygowan. 
Uh, hello from up in Ballyhill to you down there. You are above me. <laughs> yes, that wouldn't be difficult, says you. It really wouldn't, especially with the kind of jokes I crack. Raucous, love that description. Hi to all, says Deborah. Yeah, uh, raucous in a very beautiful way. Beautifully raucous. Sue Prenter's in the house. The faint whispering of spring. Definitely to be heard. Lovely day here in Fermanagh. The wonderful news is, folks, that we are now in that month of the year, sort of late February to late March. When the day expands so rapidly at this latitude that in a month's time, it won't be getting dark till nine, nine o'clock at night. It's, oh, I love it. I just love this time of year. Oh, it's so, I think, hopeful and optimistic. Padre Shields is saying, hi, Anthony Ever and uh, Jigwich, pa uh, Padre. Uh, you're very, very welcome. Spring, says Maureen. Minus 10F last night. Hang on, hang on, Maureen. Goodness sake. Give me a chance here. Minus, what's that in Celsius? <laughs> no oh hang on hang on it says minus 12 but that's 10 fahrenheit minus 23 really crikey do me a favor maureen keep that over there will you <laughs> oh man look you'd love the weather here today and there's elaine on the opposite side boasting about 27 celsius oh man elaine listen when am i coming over you know i'll bring a few books you know, we can sit out on your porch, quaff a bit of wine or whatever, and, you know, do this whole uh, reading stuff, but just without the live stream, you know. Um, I was thinking about putting salad in my covered garden beds, but there will be snow again at the end of the week, so I'll wait. Yeah, best to hold off a little bit, Monica. Yes, indeed. Um, hello from Dublin. That's Caitlin Moon. Caitlin, hope you are well and that your studies are going. Are you still studying? Says you, I'm always studying. That's my constant state. That's my constant condition. And I bow to your uh, remarkable, the breadth of your uh, studious knowledge. It's amazing. I'm not picking up on that spring energy you've got, Anthony. Struggled through work today. I'm not sure how long I'll stay awake now, but I'm sure the entertainment will keep me going. I'll do my best. <laughs> yes, you'll slap your face at a few jokes, I'm sure. Uh, Gordon Farrell is in the house. Hello, Gordon. Great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Gordon is an artist, and I've mentioned him lots of times, but Gordon's based in the county of Longford, and he's a very, very nice man. Tom King, speaking of a nice man. Hello there, Anthony, and friends of the two. Great to be among many friends. Hope all a good fettle. Working away, and it's story time. There's a mighty stretch in the evening. And isn't it mild, Tom? I mean, you work in the winter with short sleeves, and I'm I'm there going, I'm in my office with the heater on going, geez, I can't warm up. And I've got layers on, a T-shirt, a shirt and a jumper. And you're out there at the forge on the frosty mornings of winter in short sleeves. I have to say fair play to you. But that, having that sheep over your shoulder certainly helps. Having a blast. Been so lovely seeing the family. Brilliant stuff to Ziri. And uh, look, lots of uh, hugs and kisses uh, for them. Uh, family are so precious. Gary uh, Kyo is in the house. Vanity, great and good tour from South Dublin. Another fine day on the sod. The Wicklow Mountains are alive once again. It, today has been a really beautiful day. The only thing is it was very grey here in Drogheda, but uh, as the evening came, uh, the stars started to appear and the clouds started to break. Um, I think it's to get cold on Wednesday, uh, but that's good because we might be able to see the triple conjunction, Venus, Moon, Jupiter. Wednesday evening, folks. Alan Mulligan is in Belfast, uh, in Belfast. Looking forward to the episode. Brilliant stuff, Alan. You're very welcome to Live Irish Myths. Not sure if you've been here before. Uh, and if I have welcomed you before, then welcome again. But if not, Cade Mila Falcha from every one of us. Lynn Foley is in from a wet desert in El Paso, Texas. Hang on a second. No. Is that not called an oasis? <laughs> Lynn, a very good afternoon to you and all our friends in the Lone Star County. Um, and hopefully it doesn't stay wet too uh, long. Gosh, Anthony Murphy, thanks, says Joe. It has to be recognised. Miriam McChira or Miriam Eckhart, uh, who we had, myself and Tom, had the most wonderful conversation with uh, under the night sky at Ishnock last year. Miriam, great to see you. And um, I hope you are in good form. Azalea, yeah. Amadeus, sorry. You see, I knew I'd, I knew I had fecked up to zero. I hope I didn't upset you. Amadeus, yes, I apologize. Uh, but we'll say hello to Azalea as well. 
wherever she may be. Doggy heaven. All dogs go to heaven. Bernie Courtney says, good evening, everybody. Ternonawa. Bernie, great to see you. And I hope you are in good form. We will get reading soon. But this is just lovely the way people just come and look. And Cara is smothering all us all with various colored hearts. Cara Waterhouse. Cara, you're very welcome wherever you are watching on YouTube. Um, and Nick said, no, you'll have to live stream it, Anthony. You see, sometimes I don't see the comments until several minutes after I've said something, so I'm not sure what that's about. <laughs> you may have to further it. I apologize, Nick, for not keeping up. Neve Goodall says, I love this time of year also. Planting out beetroot and radishes today. It's fantastic. That sounds like the future makings of a sort of a salad or something like that down the line. Peter Andrew Nolan is in the house. Peter Andrew, you're very, very welcome. Uh, well, thank you, uh, says uh, Caitlin. I'm in the final year of PhD. I'm submitting at the end of September and defending sometime in the fall. Well, good luck with it all. And I've no doubt you will absolutely romp home with those uh, top marks. I've no doubt about it at all. Uh, Joe O'Keefe is in the house. The Milesians and the tribe of Danu. Yes, indeed. I was telling that story to a group of visitors in Drogheda on Saturday. Oh, man, were we... Uh, in the depths of Lower Gawala and having a great time. Stephen O'Hara is in Kilkenny, which was lovely today. But your Kilkenny is lovely every day, uh, Stephen. Uh, but uh, you're very welcome. Great to see you as always. Stephen is another of the Mythical Ireland patrons. I hope you won't mind me uh, mentioning that. Kathleen Gallagher resonates with the change of season as almost a joyful coming out of hibernation and rebirth. One can imagine the celebrations of ancestors having survived the winter and noting the signs of better weather and enthusiastic birdsong. 51 degrees and sunny in New York today. Wow, 51 is 10.5. That's not bad. We got 14. So we've three and a half degrees on you. But look, who's boasting? No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, Faye Mannix is sending so much love from Australia. A very good morning to you. I'm not sure if it's Faye, if that's how I pronounce it. A very good morning to you. Happy Tuesday from Monday here in the uh, Western Hemisphere slash Northern Hemisphere. And I hope the descent into autumn is a lovely one in Australia. Uh, Adina Sparks in the house. Oh, good. Haven't missed the reading. No, Anthony is in the midst of saying hello to everybody and, and pre prepping himself to tell a few jokes. Uh, Facebook user, who is this? I don't know who this is. Hope all is well with everyone. Buds and growth in the garden. And Oh, sorry. Yes, I did. That's uh, Wayne. I'm not. Um, for some reason, I'm seeing that comment again. Um, some of the comments have reappeared. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm seeing a lot of repeat comments so i'll scroll down and down and down uh miriam says i don't think i'll be able to come this year but maybe a miracle will happen and i'll be attending either way best greetings to you and tom you never know do you you just never know put that thought out there you know archaeastronomy database is saying hello to everyone <laughs> um, brilliant love it love it uh donna ferrer is saying hello to all from cloudy but spring is kind of in the air, Maryland. Glad to be here. Brilliant. We are glad to have you here, Donna. You're very welcome to the library, as you always are. Uh, John Lane is in a sunny and cool San Francisco. Good to be back in the city, by the way. I wonder if I tried to sing that song. Would, uh, would I get a uh, copyright notice on YouTube? I doubt it will be very good. You know, Scott McKenzie. I don't do a very good Scott McKenzie impression. If you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear your I watched Live Irish Mitts t-shirt like John Main. <laughs> he did get one, you know. He's going to show it to us at the earliest opportunity. Uh, Rex Fortenberry has joined us from a lovely warm Louisiana. Spread it round, Rex. Spread it round. If you've got a few degrees to spare, Elaine Dent Lingenfelter is boasting about 27 Celsius. She definitely can give us a few degrees and still not have to put on a jacket, you know. Anyway, I've caught up with the comments. I'm very glad that you're all here. Uh, this is episode number 213. Wow, man. Um, and, and this time, uh, it's hard to imagine, but this time three years ago, Live Irishmen didn't exist. Everything was 
normal in Ireland and in Europe and in America, we were anxiously watching the headlines emanating from China and other parts. I'm not sure if by this stage uh, the pandemic hadn't reached places like Italy. I know it was very difficult in Italy in the early days. But uh, all of that would change by um, the 12th of March, which was the first night. 12th of March 2020, the first night of Live Irish Mits. The, the day everything changed. The government came on the telly here in Ireland and said, stay at home, don't go to school, don't go to work. There is a plague and await further developments. And here we are, 213 episodes later, plague free, I hope. And uh, yeah, good to have you all on board, folks. It's been a hell of a journey and it's been heartwarming for me. And it's been the most amazing um it's it's been the most amazing display of humanity it's total strangers as most of us you know um feeling a kinship and feeling a warmth and a friendship and a safe place and somewhere to go and know that you're gonna be entertained and educated and that you're gonna be safe you know start forging just look what happened says tom king tom king started forging when he was sent home from work he hasn't stopped since not for a single hour okay hang on he didn't do any forging when he was in showcase because he was too busy winning awards <laughs> he's gonna be like um you know he's gonna be like uh richard harris soon enough you know he won't be able to go anywhere and everybody was looking for his autograph <laughs> uh and well deserved by the way not a hint of jealousy there, by the way. I once threw a ball for my dog. I know. Right? Yeah, it was a bit extravagant. It, but he looked great in a dinner jacket. <laughs> uh, Patricia adds, not to mention suffering through the dad jokes. I admit, I, I have inflicted that upon you all. And I do apologize, you know and uh yeah I'm, I'm loving all of the uh the nice comments i spent the whole night last night wondering where the sun had gone and then it dawned on me and i wondered why the football was getting bigger and bigger then it hit me <laughs> God. i am right jokes out of the way let's get on with the reading it's only a dad joke when it becomes apparent or apparent yes ah uh, who is that a uh, facebook user. oh this is so annoying that this i still haven't been able to rectify that when somebody comments on the mythical ireland community their name doesn't come up ah uh, that's caitlin moon i shouldn't be surprised i suspect caitlin uh, secretly is stashing all these jokes um probably has her own uh, book of, of one-liners or puns or whatever now i need a really stiff drink says patricia <laughs> you and the rest of them <laughs> uh kathy may says <laughs> good start yes we are today returning to as i said at the outset of the episode at the top still not laughing says mavanway let's let's do let's do this right everybody is to do this with me right how long can you keep a serious face for right you ready three two one go I think that was about two and a half seconds. <clears throat> hey, he, he's off. He's off. Hurt my feelings. I, I'll, I'll stop telling jokes. <laughs> That's, everybody's going, yay. He said he'll stop telling jokes. Yes. Now we will come back every time. <laughs> no wonder the viewership figures are going down. <laughs> if only he would read and stop or, you know, talk about myths and stop trying to entertain us. And McCallum has joined us. Hope everyone's well. Coming in a little bit late, but happy to be here. And your timing is impeccable because we are just about to start reading, although you have missed a few dad jokes. And I'd say the rest of them will be saying, you'll be glad that you missed them. Lies, says Patricia. <laughs> yeah, I lie when I tell you I'm not going to tell any more jokes. Anybody last any longer with the serious face thing? I always think of the biggest biggest dickest scene in 
uh, from Monty Python and the centurion with the screwed up lips. Brilliant. So we're talking about Cairns and then Stone Circles and we're beginning in Sligo, uh, which is one of my favorite parts of the world, one of my favorite parts of ancient Ireland. And uh, Michael, um, Quirk, Anthony, the filing system is still a bit old fashioned. It consists of filing cabinets in there and, and little mice that run around to fetch the files. Michael Quirk, the woodcarver and story, wonderful storyteller in Sligo, uh, who, who's still carving at the grand old age of 82, I think, in Wine Street in Sligo, says, and I, I don't dispute him, that Sligo is the most fairy place in Ireland. It is the place where the the, the veil is at its very thinnest. Mavanoi says, I laugh through most of live Irish myths, except for the joke parts. Uh, it, it, not a hint of irony there. <laughs> That's not the Oh, shut up, Anthony. When you're explaining, you're losing. Who said that? Was that one of Richard Nixon's aides during Watergate? When you're explaining, you're losing, so don't explain. Just carry on. Cairns at Moitura and Kong. There are a considerable number of other great cairns. C he spells it C-A-R-N-S, but of course we would spell it today C-A-I-R-N-S. Cairn meaning a mound that is simply a heap of stones. Just turn the heater off. It's made entirely, of, made up almost entirely of stones. Very little earth involved. Some with stone circles, other, others plain, distributed over Ireland. But with the exception of those already mentioned, there is scarcely one the interior of which has been thoroughly explored. This is 1848, remember. In his guide to Loch Corrib, the late Sir William Wilde, William Wilde was the keeper of antiquities of the Royal Irish Academy. Those antiquities later bequeathed or given to, gifted to what became the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. And also his other claim to fame, uh, oh, several other claims to fame. One was that he wrote a wonderful book, uh, Beauties of the Boyne and Blackwater, which is another very interesting study of the time of the ancient landscape. And he was also the father of Oscar Wilde. In his guide to Loch Corrib, the late Sir William Wilde describes several which are supposed to mark the scene of the Battle of Southern Moitura, fought between the Fervolug and Tua de Danans, according to the Annals of the Four Masters, in AM 3303. These are externally exactly similar to the mounds of Newgrange and Douth. So there, we are told there are two Moituras, a Moitura Kong, or uh, as he calls it here, Southern Moitura, where the battle, the famous battle, the first battle of Moitura took place between the uh, Daedanans and the Fervolug, and then the second, second battle of Moitura, which took place between the two of the Danon, led really by Lu, even though Nuadu was the king. Uh, against the Fomorians. Uh, Patricia Pack says, changing the name to Live Irish Mirth. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, let's do that. Live Irish Mirth. Yeah. Yes, 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 indeed. Joe O'Keefe says, do the Fae live in the Cairns? You won't meet many people who'll dispute it. Maybe the odd archaeologist who doesn't believe in that kind of thing, but sure, look, you know. What do they know? Padder Shields is saying hello to Archaeoastronomy Database. The mice seem to work okay, says Henry. They do, but I mean, they just don't work as fast as, say, electrons passing through a circuit board in a computer. They just don't have that same speed. And they seem to be getting a little bit slower with the time and age. I don't know. Is that a thing, folks? Is that a thing? You find yourself getting slower with age? Rhetorical question, of course. Great monument at Heapstown, County Sligo. At Heapstown, not far, not far from Ballandoon, County Sligo, is a gigantic pile of stones, and Heapstown is huge. Said to have been raised in the 4th century of our era, i.e. 400 AD, over Oliola, son, or in the 300s AD, should I say, son of Yochi Moivain, Ardri, i.e. chief king of Erin. The extreme circumference of this enormous work, which, by the by, the country people assert was erected in one night, is said to be 62 statute purchase. And so this is interesting because we have 
a, a monument that was said to have been built in one night, which is fascinating. There is, or there was, a so-called ship temple uh, that was documented by uh, Thomas Wright in his Laudiana in the mid-18th century, a century earlier, uh, which is a mysterious stone structure that looked like it actually might have been a historic rather than a prehistoric monument. But it was also called... I can't remember the name in Irish, but it translated as the work of one night, uh, that it had been erected in one night. But you see, this is interesting with regards to doubt, because remember, in order in, in the mythology of doubt in the Dinchenicus, in order for the monument to be built, the king's sister, the king being Bresal Bodibad, his sister cast a spell on the sun to make it stand still in the sky, because the men who were building the monument wanted endless day. So in other words, it was to be built all in one day. And here we have a monument of similar nature to Douth, a very large cairn of loose stones uh, being built in one night. <clears throat> the story of its having had any connection with Oliola, O-L-I-O-L-L-A, one word, is probably as true as that embodied in the peasant's legend. Nothing certain is known of its history, and we are equally ignorant concerning the origin of Miscon Nave and of the great monuments which seem to have given the name of Cairns to a townland over Clivira, the beautiful seat of Colonel Wood Martin. Now, uh, Miscom Maeve is, I think it's the butter hump of Maeve, is how it translates. Several monuments are, are given that name. There's one on, is it Muckish Mountain in Donegal? There's a cairn on the top of that mountain. Uh, it's a very interesting mountain because it's kind of got steep sides and a flat top, you know. Um, or, almost a little bit like a table mountain, you know, and uh, there's a miscon mave up there, um, the butter butter hump or mave's butter hump. All these are in the immediate vicinity of Sligo. To mention at length further instances would be to exceed the limits of a handbook. And I suppose we're kind of, I suppose we could probably say that we regret that Wakeman didn't write more and that his work wasn't more comprehensive. The difficulty with the handbook that he published was he was trying to fit a lot in, and so everything gets kind of, um, I was going to say squashed down, which is a poor way of saying, um, you know, co compressed, or it's more concise, perhaps, than we would have liked. I mean, I, I, I've written, there's a blog post there stemming from last week's episode. There was one thing in particular that he said that was fascinating about Newgrange. That I've written a fifteen hundred euro euro. <laughs> yes, if only fifteen hundred euro per blog post, wouldn't that be great? I wrote a fifteen hundred word blog post for patrons over at Patreon about it. Um, that I feel that if he only had given us more of what he had encountered on his travels, that we may know more and we may have more of these little nuggets, these beautiful little insights that maybe aren't seen elsewhere. You know. Um, apparently the sound is a bit dodgy. Sounds like you're underwater, said Neve Goodall. Oh, uh, last week I was Darth Vader. And this week, apparently I'm gurgling. Um, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Joe Butler, great minds and all that. Fools seldom differ. Um, the mice fell off for a moment. I do apologize. We have been having some issues with our broadband here. Uh, so I suspect it could be related to that. Monument at the Bar of Fintona. It will be necessary, however, to notice a few minor, typical and highly interesting sepulchres, some of which, it would appear, had been left undisturbed and unnoticed until the other day. One of the most instructive of these occurs at the Bar, B-A-R-R, -R, of Fintona, about three miles north of Trillick, County Tyrone. My attention had been drawn to the place by J.G.V. Porter, Esquire, owner of the soil. The cairn was found to consist of a mound of stones rising to a height of about eight feet above the then level of the surrounding bog. It is quite circular in plan. Resting above, sorry, resting upon the ground and just within the outer edge of the pile were eight cysts, kists, I always say cysts, no, it's not that, it's kists, as in a kist grave, each of which had the appearance of a small cromlech. Four of these chambers enclosed portions of the human skeleton, and in two of them, in addition to the remains of man, was found a crock composed of baked clay. All within the principal urn-bearing cavity was perfectly dry and undisturbed. The floor was flagged, 
And here and there lay human bones in various stages of decomposition. Sounds like a Bronze Age uh, burial, doesn't it? Or Bronze Age burial site. With them were found three vertebrae of a small mammal, probably those of a dog. A fine, richly decorated earthen vase lay on its side in the middle of the enclosure, resting upon a large, clean slab of sandstone. Oh, there is my dog. Give me one second till I let Saskia out. Uh, you need to go out, dog. Yes, indeed. Don't forget to knock when you want to come back in. She doesn't knock to get back in. She just yelps on the step outside the door, which is translates roughly as let me in. A fine, richly decorated earthen vase lay on its side in the middle of the enclosure, resting upon a large, clean slab of sandstone. Barbara Murphy's in the house. I'm back and had trouble finding the live stream. Guess that's the universe's way of saying I should be doing other things, but I'm not. <laughs> but I'm not. I missed everyone. Well, Barbara, we missed you too, and you're very welcome back to Live Irish Mits. Fantastic to have you here. Hope you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> the vessel, and yeah, don't worry, you can catch up on all that stuff later on. The ve the, the sorry, I, I, I said the vessel. The vessel evidently reposed as originally deposited. Was it a food vessel or cup? Question mark. If it were customary in the so-called Stone Age to deposit with human remains a once prized knife or dagger, arms or ornaments, why should we suppose that the deceased's favourite food holder or drinking cup might not have occasionally been left with his remains? Of course, in the mid-19th century, we didn't really know. Uh, uh, we didn't have carbon dating to tell us about, uh, you know, the... the crossover between stone and bronze age and all of that stuff <laughs> pardon me one of the kists lay on the northeast side of the mound it was oblong in form two feet th four inches in breadth by three feet six inches in length the sides and bottom were neatly flagged now this what this sounds like folks um is uh bronze age kist burials in a neolithic cairn in other words the cairn was reused such as we find for instance at fornox where there were Bronze Age burials in the mound, uh, which were later than the mound, uh, the, the date of the construction of the mound. The mound had been used for burials in the Stone Age and then reused in the Bronze Age, but in a different way. It was with great toil this grave was reached, and it proved to be secured by two ponderous covering stones, one laid immediately over the other. These being at length removed, a sight most startling and indeed impressive was presented. We looked into a chamber or kist which had not seen the light for countless centuries, never since the age of stone, and there upon the floor, cushioned in damp dust, lay the remains or portions of the skeletons of two human beings, white and clean, as contrasted with the dark brown colour of their kindred mould. The crania, which I carefully removed, are now in the Museum Royal Irish Academy. Strange to say, there were no traces of the lower jaws, nor even of teeth. From the narrow proportions of the kist, it is quite manifest that no two perfect human bodies, even those that she's yelping already, she's like, let me back in, I'm done with doing my thing. Even those of very young people could have been there deposited. The space was far too limited to have contained even one unmutilated corpse. The bones exhibited no trace of the action of fire. They were certainly unburnt and were unaccompanied by traces of charcoal or ashes of any kind. Upon the mould which lay on the floor being anxiously sifted, no bead, flint, flake or manufactured article of any description was discovered. And as the bottom and sides of the kist were composed of cleanly split sandstone, it was evident that nothing but human remains had been there entombed, unless indeed we may suppose that an earthen vessel or similarly perishable object had crumbled into dust amongst the animal matter. What then are we to consider as to the, na the nature of this deposit? A similar question might arise in connection with the remains already noticed, as the kists or graves in which they were found could not possibly have contained one adult human form unless the body had been dissevered and packed within the narrow house, which of course we now know was a custom of prehistory. Dissevered or dismemberment and defleshing, all that stuff. It is perhaps equally singular that while the crania were fairly perfect, 
Almost the whole of the remainder of the skeletons should have been missing. Uh, well, it's fascinating that because um, we did remember in the episode where we were speaking about Sligo and uh, the uh, investigation of the uh, remains, the, the bone remains from Sligo, we did, didn't we, stumble upon information that suggested that at a certain period of the Neolithic, that there was a focus on the burial of the, the cranium or fragments of the cranium. Um, yeah, that's uh, episode number 194, Rites of Passage, the Sligo Bones. I'm just going to copy that link uh, just in case uh, you, you want to have a look at it after we're finished. And of course, you can find that on the easiest place to find it is probably on the YouTube channel. Uh, but it, uh, all of the episodes are also available on the on the on the Mythical Ireland Facebook page, but they're harder to find. I think. I love that we all sit in your library slash office and feel like family, especially getting to know your dog and get to hear the want to come in yelp. True family, love this group, brilliant stuff. Uh, Marcia, she's I don't know if you can hear her in the background. She's uh, Karen Fay O'Loughlin is sneaking in the back row late. That's okay, we don't mind. There's no need. To to apologize and i know you didn't apologize but um yeah it's great to have you and uh, hope you enjoy uh, your time here <laughs> karen Fay o'loughlin noted in the little black book mm, late <laughs> not at a point in the circumference of the mausoleum which may be described as lying southeast from the center was a simple kist of quadrangular form measuring 17 by 18 inches and the depth 18 inches. Its depth was 18 inches. The little chamber was found to contain some traces of greyish earth, somewhat like lime mortar. This occurred here and there in the generally darker mould and had the appearance of being a decomposition of human or other bones. A cavity precisely similar in formation, but somewhat smaller, lay in the circle at a distance of about nine feet from the kist last noticed. This also yielded nothing of interest. Upon the northwest side of the cairn were two kists which in my temporary absence were dug up by treasure seekers and others. The havoc here perpetrated by ignorance is greatly to be lamented, as in as in one of the kists, an or ornamental vase, one fragment of which I was fortunate enough to recover, had been found. Well, um, probably the excavations that took place in the 19th century were acts of vandalism anyway, but vandals, vandalizing, it's been a long running problem, folks, hasn't it? In connection with this vessel was discovered a beautifully formed knife of flint. When perfect, as originally found, it measured three inches by three tenths in length and one and a half inch at its broadest part. The blade is extremely thin and exhibits on one side a central ridge, the other surface being flat or slightly convex. Like most implements of its class, it presents admirably chipped edges. As a hunter's companion in the hands of primitive man, this relic of the so-called Stone Age would have answered several purposes. It would have skimmed the prey, cut or sawn the flesh, and divided the hide of red deer, wolf, or of almost any animal into the desired forms for dress or tent covers, or into thongs for bowstrings, slings, or ropes, or for curragh manufacture, etc. The colour was dark grey, and the instrument showed no evidence of its having been submitted to the action of fire. The grave now shall be noticed, sorry, the grave now to be noticed is the last of the group to which I shall have to refer. It lay nearly midway between the first described and the more northern of the two, which had been shattered by the treasure seekers. It, it also was in all, in all but utter ruin, owing partly to the dampness of its position and perhaps in some degree to the comparatively inferior material of its component parts. The contents presented human bones, those of adults, so soft and decomposed as not to bear the slightest touch. They suggested the idea of softish mortar or, or of 
uh, putty. Carlos says, hi there. Jigwich, Carlos, you're very welcome to Live Irish Mits. Good evening to you. I can't remember where I left off. Not to bear the slightest touch. They suggested the idea of softish mortar or, or of putty. No artificial object was here found, though everything was done to bring the, to light any deposit which might have accompanied the bones. It is well, perhaps, to state that upon a trench being excavated from the northern side, through more than half the diameter of the cairn, no central kist or chamber was found. The importance of the discoveries made at the bar in their bearings upon more than one archaeological question will doubtlessly by a careful reader be acknowledged. Whether the human remains there found, apparently huddled together in kists not sufficiently large to have contained an entire adult body, were those of victims immolated during the celebration of sepulchral rites, or whether they are relics of persons slain in battle, buried and subsequently disinterred for final sepulture in the territory of their people or ancestors are questions which it would be very difficult to decide let's skip forward a little bit because i want to get to the stone circles just conscious of the time <coughs> i'm not running <coughs> on too late into the evening or the morning for our australian viewers or the afternoon for our canadian and american and south american viewers let me just have a look oh yeah good bit to read still so um Barbara says, isn't it believed that many of the looted Egyptian tombs were looted shortly after being closed? Why should Ireland be any different than that? Things were looted throughout the monuments lifetime. Yeah, that's true. But I suppose in the modern era, we have felt, we have found, um, you know, um, contemporary burials in Newgrange. The NG10 cranium, cranial parts were dated to about 5,200 years ago. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's... It's been going on as long as time. The only thing is there is a special case to be made in Ireland uh, for for cert certainly in more recent centuries. I'm not sure how far back the tradition goes of the good people, but certainly the, the presence of the good people did protect a lot of monuments from the, uh, shall we say, uh, from incursion uh, by the peasantry. But it, it was usually um, non-native uh, non-natives um, who uh, desecrated or excavated monuments or treasure, looking for treasure or whatever. Tarini Pendleton is in the house in Laguna Beach, California. Good afternoon, Tarini. Welcome to the live stream. And we are beginning, I'm going to read a bit from the chapter that is called Chapter 5, Stone Circles and Alignments. And I'm going to take a sip of water <coughs> and a deep breath for uh, the uh, aftermath of the dad jokes. I can't believe we've done this 213 times plus all of the conversation episodes plus the book talk which really has merged into this because this is what this is <clears throat> so we've probably all together done about 230 episodes of various things anyway you know stone circles of great magnitude are to be seen in many parts of ireland of the lesser kind numerous examples occur in various counties and particularly in the north and northwest. These are invariably composed of rough, unhewn blocks, varying in height from two to ten, sorry, I was gonna say two to ten, two to eleven feet or more above the level of the adjoining land. And in some instances are en en encompassed with a low earthen mound or ditch. <clears throat> Their area, though often apparently unoccupied, is not in, in, unfrequently found to contain some or other of the following remains 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 one a cromlech as at the broadstone parish of finvoy county antrim and scores of other places <coughs> finvoy is a, a common enough place name uh, finn being bright or white and voy being uh, from my uh, uh, plain uh, the bright plain two a tumulus or cairn as at Newgrange, Douth and Nouth and elsewhere. Three, a smaller circle or circles. Four, menhirs or pillar stones, as in large standing stones. Five, kists. Human bones, cinerary urns, ashes, 
Weapons, implements, or ornaments of bone or flint, etc., etc., are almost invariably discovered within these enclosures upon the earth being disturbed. The urns are usually enclosed between four stones covered by a flag and are rarely found at a greater depth from the surface than about one foot or 18 inches. And of course, they are the kissed graves, which we uh, almost exclusively uh, associate with the Bronze Age, uh, the kissed burials. Uh, as he did just described them there. Schlievenagradle, uh, is that G R I E I D L E? Schlievenagradle circle, one of the most interesting circles for reasons hereafter to be stated, occurs in Schlievenagradle or Griddle Mountain near Down Patrick in the county of Down. But several of much greater magnitude claim our attention at present. Circle near Newtown Butler County, Fermanagh. Probably the most notable circle now remaining in Ireland is that called the Druids Temple, situate on the summit of a hill near Wattle Bridge, a small hamlet in the vicinity of Newtown Butler County, Fermanagh. Not the slightest notice of this structure has, as far as I'm aware, been hitherto published, nor have any drawings of it appeared. It's, it seems to have been wholly unknown to Mr. Ferguson, that is, James Ferguson, who wrote Rude Stone Monuments. The stones vary in length from three to upwards of 10 feet. The largest remaining measures slightly over 10 feet. It is six feet, five inches in breadth and three feet, nine inches in thickness. Another is seven feet high, eight feet, five inches broad and five feet in thickness. The circle on the interior measures in diameter 126 feet. The diameter of the outer ring at Stonehenge is generally stated, according to Ferguson, to be 100 feet. I think they're comparing monument sizes here, folks. It's something that uh, archaeologists seem to have been doing for a long time. Mine is bigger than yours. <laughs> that sort of stuff. Whether this circle, and in, in the case of Newgrange and Stonehenge, ours is older than yours. <laughs> <laughs> I jest, of course. Kind of. Whether this circle was ever enclosed by an outer work, as was common with kindred structures in Britain and elsewhere, can probably never be ascertained. For more than 200 years, the land immediately adjoining has been subject to the plough. That there were outside works, however, can scarcely admit of a doubt. On the southeast side, at a distance of five paces from the circle, are five large stones, the ruins of a dolmen, which many years ago, in the memory of a person recently dead at the time of my visit, had been wrecked for the sake of its material. And again, that's another common tale, not just vandalism for vandalism's sake, but actually the, the destruction or part destruction or wanton vandalism of a monument uh, for its stone to make other things. Laura Inky Fingers is saying hello from Canada. For good afternoon, Laura. Welcome, Slauncha. Uh, Falja Guji on Lowerlin, uh, and I hope you make yourself comfortable and you enjoy the rest of the live stream. Hello to my favorite cleric. When I was working in Ethiopia, there was a cleric living beside us who would broadcast via loud sleep speaker when it suited him, i.e., 3 4 5 a.m. on mad volume, <laughs> says Peter in Monaster Boys. Yeah, I'm I could do that, I could get one of those loud hailer things or a PA system and broadcast the episode for the nearby residents of Drada and also for the residents up on the hill at Monaster Boys without ever needing to switch on the camera, you know. My informant was Mr. John Mackey, postmaster of the neighbouring village. He stated that his father, who had died just five years before, at the age of 90, used to tell him he had, sorry, used to tell how he had witnessed the destruction of the Dolman or Cromlech. And this is why, or part of the reason why, these uh, uh, documented journeys through ancient Ireland of the 19th century are so important, because... None of this would have been recorded except in oral or verbal lore. And that, of course, was being lost later on. Uh, well, lost at the time of the famine and lost through emigration and other things. Um, so, as I said, it's just a pity that Wakeman wasn't able to produce a much more comprehensive volume or series of volumes, you know. 
The old gentleman used further to affirm that before the, quote, rooting up, unquote, of the place, the ground for a considerable space round the megalith was regularly paved with flagstones. Surely Lord Urn, who resides close to the spot and is, I believe, owner of the soil, might well investigate the character in all its details of this unique monument. And there we I, I go. We go again, referring to the fact that a lot of these uh, antiquarian uh, investigations and excavations uh, were carried out by people who were not native to the area. Keith Doran is in Australia and is saying good morning to us. Keith, good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. So wonderful uh, to have a number of Australian viewers today. I hope you're keeping well down there and that the gentle slide into autumn is suiting you temperature wise uh, after I probably what has been a very hot summer and then we get on to the circle at Newgrange so we had Wakeman speaking about Newgrange earlier but now he's talking talking specifically about the what we call the great circle the stones that uh, stand the standing stones around the monument the stones which encompass the monuments of Newgrange and Douth are generally very large, some of them measuring eight or nine feet in height. So that's immediately fascinating because like, there are no extant standing stones around Douth. There are stones in the field of Douth that protrude a little bit above the, the grass, but not nine feet in height. Um, so uh, that's... a. Uh, an interesting one straight away. Um, the field uh, in which Douth is situated has not in recent centuries, I believe, uh, been ploughed. Um, and there are ridges that look like they might be potato ridges, but uh, from perhaps the 19th century or earlier. Um, but there's a, probably a lot of stuff under the soil there that's undisturbed because of the fact that it has largely escaped the plough. The engraving represents a portion of the circle at the former place, that is Newgrange, of which a description has already been given. There are several minor examples in the same neighbourhood, but they are in a great state of dilapidation, and with one exception, would hardly repay a student for the time occupied in visiting them, particularly as the grandeur remains, sorry, the grander remains at Newgrange are so accessible. I may state, however, that portions of a fine circle, or rather oval, lie a little to the east of Douth Hall, to the left of the road from Drogheda. Many of the stones have been removed, and but several of gigantic proportions remain in their ancient position. Uh, and this is the site that was documented also by the likes of George Coffey, whose work we will read, by the way, uh, called Clock uh, at uh, Douth Hall. Uh, now, sadly, uh, any any visit I've visited that location several times in the past twenty four years. Uh, sadly, it seems that all signs of this monument have vanished. There are a couple of stones lying around, or parts of stones. One of them looks like it. It there, an attempt was made made to break it. So it looks like this monument, which was already in a dilapidated and partly ruined state in the eighteenth, sorry, in the nineteenth century, in the eighteen hundreds, uh, has completely vanished but maybe just maybe bits of it, some of the large stones, perhaps with engravings on them, are, to, are yet to be found beneath the soil. Time will tell. Some of the finest monuments of the class under notice, which I've seen in Ireland, occur near the shore of Loch Gur, at a short distance to the north of the little town of Bruff in the county of Limerick, and in the immediate vicinity of Raffo in the northwest, respectively. For the purposes of a handbook, however, a sufficient number of typical examples have already been given. A circle encompassing a cromlech formerly stood upon Dawkey Common, but it has disappeared. I presume he's talking about Dawkey here in the county of Dublin. But it has disappeared, the stones having been blasted and quarried by some public contractor engaged in the creation or the erection of the Martello Tower near that place. <sighs> Wow. I'm just taking notes here because I'm not sure if I knew that or had read that before. So the Martello Tower at Dawkey 
uh, one of a series of Martello towers built along the East Coast during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, built in the early 1800s. It was apparently built from stone made from a destroyed stone circle and cromlech. This outrage occurred about the beginning of the present century. There you go. When Dawkey Common was almost a desert. Since then, <coughs> desert, <laughs> des desert, not a desert. Ah, uh, yes. Are we live? Because if we're not live, we can just record that bit again. Yeah, let's record that bit again. This is It's not live. Oh, we're not live. Good. Okay. Take two. This outrage occurred about the beginning of the present century when Dawkey Common was almost a desert. <laughs> or a dessert with a, you know, chocolate flakes and a, a little... Uh, strawberry on top of it or something <laughs> since then hundreds of houses walls etc etc have been built upon the common with the stone of the district which is yet so abundant that material for the erection of a city might be removed and hardly missed <laughs> monica wants to know if i'm hungry <laughs> uh, barbara murphy is saying hello to lexi uh, is lexi here um if she is i didn't say hello to her so lexi erickson uh reveal yourself say hello would martello terra at dramana also have ancient stone in its construction says north county moocher <laughs> i don't know is this quick answer um I, I, you'd have to um probably refer to and you know whatever records there are in, in that vicinity it's probably very difficult to tell but it just makes me wonder uh if i wouldn't do something that uh my friend ken williams does with old stone wall in the vicinity of uh uh you know stone age sites is to look for megalithic art inscribed upon them you know in many parts of france england and scotland we're talking about alignments now and i presume he's talking about stone row alignments rather than astronomical alignments bear with me for a moment In many parts of France, England and Scotland may be seen lines of stones placed upon end and generally some few feet apart. The row is occasionally of a length not exceeding a few yards, but sometimes it appears to cover ground which might be measured by miles. The size of the stones in each group is extremely various, some of the blocks being of large proportions and others measuring barely three or four feet in height. All are invariably untouched by a tool presenting the appearance of rough surface stones or of such as are usually found in glacial scooped ravines or river beds these lines are never single and never and sorry these lines are never single and usually present in parallel rows varying in number from 4 or 5 to 10 or more for want of a better name these relics of a mysterious past have been variously styled avenues alignments rows uh, parallel, parallelitha, 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 and etc. And it is not too much. Apparent. That's definitely pronunciation. Desert and dessert. I got myself mixed up. Parallelitha. I've never heard of. It, it is not too much to assert that works of the kind, even from the days of Stukely, that's William Stukely, the antiquarian, have presented the most difficult problem, which it has been the task of many British and foreign antiquaries to solve. Hitherto, we have had little beyond conjecture referring to their uses. They seem like galleries which lead to nothing. Tombs, temples, or processional avenues, they could not have been, yet their construction affords unmistakable evidence of organised labour and deliberate design. Uh, somebody sending me some jokes here, uh, which I will share with you later. Of remains of this class, but two have hitherto been recognised in Ireland. I was just going to say that those long alignments of stones, such as you see at Karnak, are, are not a uh, not even not even a, a common feature in Ireland. 
uh, but but uh, are almost unheard of. You know, we uh, Monica says we have an alignment of stones in our neighbor neighbor village in central Switzerland. There's a documentation about them in a book here. Fascinating stuff. So this stuff's going on, uh, you know, not just on the periphery of Europe. You know, I guess some of those terms never caught on, says uh, uh, Arc Astronomy Database. Yes, indeed. Of remains of this class, but two have been hitherto recognized in Ireland. We're about uh, two pages and a little bit um, a, a, a from the end. So what time are we on? Ah, it's only five past nine and it took us half an hour to get going. So. Look, we'll keep going until the text is finito, until, until Toshe Krekna. In point of magnitude, our alignments, if I may use the term, cannot be compared with those of France or England. But they, not, they, but they may not be unfavorably compared with some described by Sir Henry Dryden, as seen by him in Scotland. It is perhaps well here to observe that in not a few instances in Ireland, we possess lines of stone, sometimes single, never more than dual, which, however, should not, not be confounded with those of the alignment class, as they are undoubtedly the remains of passages which led to sepulchral chambers and have either been stripped of their covering slabs or were never finished. Such rows may indeed sometimes be looked upon as portions of ruined dolmens or skeleton traces of monuments like those of the Boyne or like that of Mays How in Orkney. We find such stones of various sizes differing as at Finner near Bally Shannon from one and a half to two or two feet six inches or so above ground or so as at Brago near Killy uh, near sorry uh, Brago and Killy near Enniskillen with an elevation of six or seven feet. No definite opinion can be formed as to what kind of monument the two latter groups of stones should be assigned, though they in all probability represent but Rexel class, which at a time now forgotten, but almost certainly modern, were exhumed during the process of turf cutting. <clears throat> the Bay Moor uh, stone circles uh, were they found from as a result of turf cutting. Patricia Pack is warning you all, don't encourage him, people. Of these, as well as several other broken or never completed relics of a me megalithic class founded in, found, founded, found in several parts of Ireland, it is only certain that they rest on the till upon which peat to a depth of from eight to 12 inches or more, sorry, from eight to 12 feet or more once lay. Many, many of the mountain or at least highland levels of the northern portions of the British islands appear to have been gradually enveloped in bog to an extent which, if based on unusually, oh, sorry, unusually received scientific calculations concerning the average rate of the growth of peat would give works of human construction found upon the supporting clay an age of at least 4,000 years. The antiquities of Cavancara, a district situate on a shoulder of Topid Mountain, about four miles from Enniskillen, consist of two chambered cairns, a stone circle, and a small but well-defined alignment. The latter and the circle, within the memory of persons still vigorous, lay buried to a depth of from 8 to 12 feet beneath the surface of a mountain bog. And he's talking about Topid Mountain, uh, Cavan Cara, uh, near Enniskillen. I wonder, is this Quilca? And I wonder, are these monuments the same as those of the, the Cavan Burren? Um, perhaps somebody lo local to that district will know. The alignment consists of rows of stones, four in number, extending as far as can be traced 480 feet in a direction very slightly northwest and southeast. The blocks average about three feet in height by two feet in width and six inches in thickness and present the appearance of the ordinary red sandstone flags of the district. The extreme southeastern portion of the work has probably been destroyed. But in that direction, the lines could never have extended much further than they do at present, as the ground suddenly descends, forming one side of a deep ravine. 
through which in wintertime a mountain torrent, pardon me, usually rushes, still carrying on the sculpturings of nature. I love that. How far to the northwest the lines may be traced is at present uncertain and cannot be known until the peat in that direction shall have, shall have been further lowered. Probably, however, beyond the circle, no considerable extension would be discovered. The cairns here, cairns, I, I should, he has no eye in it, so I should probably pronounce it the way he spells it. The cairns here are in a very ruinous condition, having for the greater part of a century served as a quarry for building purposes. The plan of one of them is extremely similar to that of the monument at the bar of Fintona already described. There was no central chamber. Only two of its circle of, of kists remain in a good state of preservation. The stone circle standing near the northwestern side of the avenue is 20 feet in diameter and is formed of 12 standing stone blocks, which at present rise but two or three feet above the level of the bog. A second alignment extends to a distance of about 40 feet in a northeasterly direction from the circle upon Schlievena Gradle or Griddle Mountain near Downpatrick in County Down. It is composed of stones of large size, but considerably smaller than those of the circle. And uh, that is as far as I propose to go this evening in terms of that reading. If you have any questions or comments, I'm going to hang around for a bit. I'm also going to see if I can quickly slide. Um, yes. So what, what do we think, folks? Would we like more of uh, Wakeman next week? Um, his, his next section, his next chapter is about rats and duns, the lish, the lish or cahar, the cashel. So, you know, the forts, which would be later. Uh, he has a chapter about oratories and uh, early Christian uh, remains. I, I actually think that would be fascinating if we want to go there. Uh, that live Irish myths doesn't always have to be about mythology and when it's about archaeology it doesn't always have to be about prehistory I, th I think we might learn something from maybe delving into some of the pre-Christian stuff uh, yes please straight away and I presume that's Ka Caitlin uh, Moon no that's Barbara Murphy uh, yes please uh, Nick S. Casterton yes please so yeah we will we'll do more Wakeman next week but coming soon I will also read from Newgrange and other incised tumuli in Ireland uh, by George Coffey. I think this was originally published published in 1912, or was it the later one was published in 1912? Let me just check. Yeah, first published 1912. Um, There's a fascinating insight, mainly about Bruna Bonia, but that's another one that we could definitely delve into. Uh, but if you're happy to continue with Wakeman, I, I'm I personally finding him very interesting. Don't know about the rest of you. Just wanted to make sure that we were all... Uh, more be great, says uh, Adrian. Yes, says Tarini... Uh, Monica says that would be great. Yes. Laura says yes! Exclamation mark. Oh yes, continue next week, please. Uh, that's Bernie Courtney. Um, Karen Faye O'Loughlin, go for it. Yeppy, please. Yeppy, please, sir, says uh, Rex. Okay, brilliant. Great stuff, because you know what? I'm actually really enjoying it. Um, uh, I'm enjoying this uh, uh, insight. Uh, as I say, famine era, kind of a little bit of a shame. All the stuff that happened back then. That uh, well to do antiquarians who were never short of a sandwich or a meal uh, were going around exploring ancient Irish ruins while the local population were starving. But anyway, look, we won't solve all the world's um, problems in one night, but we'll, uh, we'll certainly uh, remember the, uh, the conditions uh, of the time. Uh, a couple more. Oh, yes, I'm currently reading a book about a couple of insects who fall in love in an Italian city. It's a romance novel. <laughs> romance, romance novel. What was it I said earlier? And you're explaining, you're losing. Stop explaining. Yes, that's all you're getting because I know you're absolutely going to just switch off now anyway. Um, yeah, we'll do an entire episode of Jokes One of the Nights. Coder Barks, yes, too, says Monica. Yes, he has been heard, finally. Uh, you never disappoint, says Elaine. Good. And uh, uh, as I said, don't forget now, Lone Star State. If I'm in the States and I'm anywhere in the vicinity, 
I'll be calling to say hello and uh, try to enjoy some of that Texan weather that you're always boasting about. <laughs> uh, yes, lol. Great episode. Thanks, Adrian. Glad you enjoyed it very much so. Uh, and Anna Smith. Um, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Anthony. Always love your shows. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. Didn't say hello to you earlier on, I don't think, but um, thank you for your, your comment. And uh, we will return next week, uh, God willing, the gods willing, uh, the Dedanon willing, uh, with more from William F. Wakeman. And Eve Goodall really enjoyed this episode. Brilliant. Gl glad to hear it. It is very interesting. Let Coda tell the joke sometimes. Rex, haven't you been here in the live streams when he has basically completely taken over, you know? Um, but anyway, listen. Have a great uh, week, folks. Uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, my Australian viewers, uh, our Australian friends, uh, have a great Tuesday. All our friends in Ireland and Britain and Europe have a great night. All of you in the States and South America and Canada um, have a great rest of your day. And I know these things come and go very quickly, but look, there's always more. Don't forget that Every day of the week, there are posts on Mythical Ireland on the main Facebook page. There are posts on the Mythical Ireland community where you can also post, which means that there's an eclectic range of stuff. Uh, if you're on Instagram, Mythical Ireland is on Instagram sharing regularly. If you're on Twitter, uh, we're also there. And as I said before, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel where there is a great deal of material, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of it. I kid you not. In the meantime, thank you all for watching. It's been such a pleasure and an honor and a privilege for me, as it always has been from day one of this wonderful journey into the past, uh, to share it with you uh, good folks far and wide, the nearest ones locally to me here, uh, the furthest ones on the opposite side of the uh, planet. Thank you for tuning in. I will see you all next week. All that it remains for me to say at this point in time is Ikawa Kolosov. Slán and most importantly of all, rock on to us, says Rex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Togaboge, take it easy.